were, y'all are all acting like you were just you, you're saints from the beginning. Have you ever danced with someone and it's awkward, it's like this, you know, and it's like you're moving and you know it just doesn't flow? You with me, Twana? You ever, okay. Marsha, I know you did some clubbing. Hey everybody, I'm James and welcome back. This is Fundy Fridays. I want to start off by just taking a moment to thank you all so much for the positive response to my last video covering Marjorie Taylor Greene. By the time you see this video, I will have resigned my HR position for a life of content creation. I won't pretend I'm not nervous as all heck. I've been motivated to move forward because you all have been just so dadgum rad. And speaking of that, I wanted to directly thank you for accompanying me on my little deep dive into Marjorie. Your all's presence really helped with the existential dread problem that comes with that topic. I also have over a page here of books and objects and things like that that you all said you might swear in on if you were ever elected to Congress. Those are really cool. I appreciate those answers. If you're curious, my favorite was whoever said their DVD box set of The King of Queens. I also had a couple of corrections. Viewer Colleen S. pointed out to me that Milledgeville, as mentioned in the Marjorie Taylor Greene video, is not located in Forsyth County, but is in Baltimore. Baldwin County south of Atlanta, whereas Forsyth County is north of Atlanta and the major town is, I shit you not, coming. A lot of you pointed it out, but Colleen made me laugh the hardest, so she gets the mention here. I did also want to note that Marjorie currently lives in Rome, Georgia, in Floyd County, and is squarely in her 14th district. I really do apologize for the mistake, but at the same time, if she didn't bounce districts so much, maybe I wouldn't be in this situation, right? I also wanted to note that in the last video, I mentioned that Marjorie had three extramarital affairs, uh, supposedly. However, it was actually two. The third one was supposed to be a joke about it being Jesus Christ, uh, but we didn't edit it right, so it didn't quite come across. Uh, only two uh, suspected affairs at this time. All right, so with all of that out of the way, let's continue our sordid deep dive into the wonderful world of evangelical American Christianity and conservative politics. Won't that be fun, class? Well, correct. Well, regardless of your tears, we're still going to talk about it. And to start us off with that, I'm going to be discussing Paula White. No, 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 that's Paul White. This is Paula White, seen here dressed in white and looking very white. And also, holy 80s airbrushing, Batman. That woman has no pores. Paula White most recently rose to prominence through her role as spiritual advisor to President Donald Trump. But many do not know that her associations with Trump began long before his most recent role as Emperor of the Grand Hellscape. And while her current fame may be most based on this connection, to Trump, Paula White is a fascinating and concerning character all on her own, and so I think she's worth having a conversation about in and of herself. The sudden escalation of her power and influence and status with her most recent role makes it only more important that we look into her as a figure on her own so that we can understand who she is, what she represents, and what she planned to do with the ear of the most powerful man in the free world. Suffice it to say, there's a lot of designer luggage to unpack with this whole situation. Uh, this luggage, I think, specifically. So let's get to unzip it and see what we can find. Also, quick note, there's a lot of surnames and changes of name and things like that throughout this story. I'm going to primarily be referring to her as Paula. I don't know her like that exactly, but it was just the easiest thing to do here. So, where did we begin? Paula Furr was born in Tupelo, Mississippi on April 20th of 1966. Paula was born to parents Myra Jo Nell and Donald Paul Furr III, who both play in their own way an instrumental role in Paula's life and career. See, this was a turbulent marriage, and tragically it ended when Paula's father committed suicide when she was five. You will see her utilize this story as part of her sermons and preaching to show people just how far God can go into the depths to recover you from pain and sorrow. And a lot of that was re really attributed to the fact that my father took his life when he was five years old. That's not a blame. I'm not a victim. But the fact is I didn't grow up with a father. I didn't know what it was to have, you know, a normal setting. I didn't understand what healthy and wholeness and safe and everything else was. Uh, nobody walked me down the aisle or when it was prom time, I dressed myself and, you know, I, di I didn't understand that. There was no conference of blessing and patriarch. Well, that doesn't make me less because God's done some pretty awesome things in my life. Amen? God's a really cool God. In her books, she would expand on this account of domestic violence, child abuse, and lasting trauma. My dad comes in one night, he's been drinking excessively, and he grabs one hand of me. My mother grabs the other and they begin to pull me like a raggedy Ann doll, just tugging at me. 
He says, give her to me or I'll kill myself. She says, no, I won't. She held on to me with her life, and my father extended his hand out and began to bash her head in. I had never seen a violent side to my father, so they call for the police, take him away, put him in jail overnight. He gets out and takes his life, as he said he would. White reports that following this incident, her mother would sink into depression and alcoholism along with the hectic work schedule that comes with being a single mother, at least for some time, of Paula and her brother uh, in the 70s. Myra would move with her children to Memphis, Tennessee following her husband's suicide before marrying a Navy admiral and settling down in the Washington, D.C. area where Paula would spend the rest of her youth. Paula expresses that she spent most of her time with caregivers and unfortunately that some of these caregivers sexually abused her and that she also developed an eating disorder at this time. Guys, there was a time that I was bulimic. There was a time that I was anorexic when I was a young girl. I got pregnant when I was 18 years old. And I know you're like, my gosh, I'll just tell everything. And I would sit there and I would purge myself. I had all kinds of issues, all kinds of jacked up. And I would sit there and I would say, God, please forgive me. Please forgive me before I'd ever do it. And I'd keep on doing it. Now, before I get into any of my issues with Paula, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that she has been through some incredible difficulties and trauma. I'm not going to invalidate these things because I think that's kind of gross and I can disagree with someone without having to do that. I understand that it's her story to tell and that she can discuss it how she chooses even if I don't always agree with how she utilizes it. White reports that she would first convert to Christianity at 18 years old at the Church of God in Damascus, Maryland. She also stated at this point that she received direct visions from God. On her television show in July 2000, 2005, White recounted the vision she received from God shortly after conversion. When I was just 18 years old and barely saved, the Lord gave me a vision that every time I opened my mouth and declared the word of the Lord, there was a manifestation of His Spirit where people were either healed, delivered, or saved. When I shut my mouth, they fell off into utter darkness and God spoke to me and said, I called you to preach the gospel. Around this time, Paula would also marry the first of her three husbands, local musician Dean Knight. Paula would give birth to her only biological child during this marriage, son Bradley Knight. And actually, let's take a moment to detour over to Bradley or Brad for a second. In the spirit of a lot of other evangelical pastors, you know, your, your Shamblins and your Falwells, Paula seems to be trying to bring Brad along for the ride on the donation-funded private jet. Brad himself is a pastor. You guys are used to me coming here and preaching. I like to preach. That's where I teach preach. That's where I mostly like go through the Bible, read the text, talk to you in this tone, and then every once in a while I get excited. I call it treaching. And Paula even transferred senior pastoral duties of New Destiny Christian Center to him in 2019. But all that being said, this dude has none of the public profile that the other children of mega pastor evangelicals seem to. Honestly, his most notable achievement is getting into an internet argument with a, an independent rapper named Shay Lin over his inclusion of Paula's name in a song called False Teachers. <laughs> For real though, the song is rad and there is a Spotify link in the description. And see, Brad's only other political involvement just seems to be as a background character for his mother's weird Trump worship that we're gonna get to later. Oh, and also, fuck you for the Bob Gibson jersey. Brad. That man is a St. Louis icon, and he did not overcome racial adversity while also putting up an unprecedented 1.12 ERA in 1968 just to have some anti-BLM never was try to co-opt his coolness. Why don't you go ahead and wear this jersey I made for you special instead? I was, I was a jock in high school. Did, did Jen not tell you that? All right, anyway, back to his mom's first marriage. Paula and Dean would go their separate ways and divorce in 1989. Anymore, Paula makes very occasional references to her first marriage, but never uses Dean's name, which kind of seems purposeful to me. For his part, Dean seems to think the whole thing was just a whirlwind romance between underprepared kids. Here's a bit of an article on the subject. She was very attractive, which was the first thing that caught my eye, recalls Knight, who owns a janitorial service near Frederick, Maryland, and is the lead vocalist in a family country rock band called the Knight Brothers. Hair color was different. She was a brunette, but she was always beautiful. And she was a little wild. We were crazy in our youth. Paula's next romantic relationship after this would begin pretty quickly with Maryland pastor Randy White. They met in 1987, and by the time they both divorced their spouses in 1989, they jumped very quickly into dating before marrying each other in 1990 and then relocating to Tampa, Florida in 1991. Now see, while Randy here might look like a frosted-tipped halfling at the quarterly shareholders meeting, he certainly 
matched Paula in terms of his motivation and drive. The couple founded their first church very soon after arriving in Tampa in 1991, named the Tampa Christian Center at first before being changed to Without Walls International Church. Please note that if you try to Google that one, there is a large Houston church called Church Without Walls that is unaffiliated. Please also note that both of these churches do in fact have walls. Now it is important to note that this particular picture of the Without Walls Church is from 2007. In the beginning, they were not nearly this prosperous. There isn't much information available publicly regarding the church's activities from 1991 to 1998, although it is reported that they changed location several times and that Paula and Randy relied heavily on the kindness of their congregation before they were able to even start collecting a salary in 1993. But despite these humble beginnings, the church would continue to grow over the years, and by 1999 they boasted a congregation of 5,000 members, now housed in a large bubble dome tent. But see, their coverage and wealth expanded in this time frame too. Their outreach ministries were 230 plus and reached 10,000 more individuals on top of their main congregation, and they also boasted a $6 million budget just in 1999. And see, even in these early days, Paula was known as a dynamic presence who really knew how to engage a crowd. She could make people feel like God really cared about them on a personal level. And notedly, the church did place a significant emphasis on community outreach and social welfare programs, which is itself a good thing. The problem was there seemed to be more of a focus on recruitment than actually benefiting the public good. If the people are hungry, don't just tell them that Jesus loves them. Feed them, and then they'll know there's a God that cares about them. When a church begins to get beyond its comfort zone, out of its four walls, it's going to grow because people are hungry. The church helped get people off welfare, then found they had lost their medical benefits, so it created a full staff medical center with a thousand patients, plus a mobile unit. We have a Votex center, a truck driving school, cosmetology school, a computer skills class, and an employment agency. We think welfare reform is the greatest thing that ever happened to the church because the church can finally be the church. To provide a little context, the welfare reform that Paula is talking about here was Bill Clinton's 1996 Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act. This was a bipartisan bill endorsed by both Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, seen here laughing at about how many poor people's lives they're about to screw up, and as one might expect from anything endorsed by Newt Gingrich, this so-called welfare reform was very, very aligned with the Republican worldview. It placed new and unnecessary limits on who could collect welfare benefits, the conditions that had to be met so that those benefits could be collected, and how long they could collect them at all. So when you hear Paula say that she's happy for welfare reform there, know that she just means that when the government hurts poor people, it's a really, really good recruiting opportunity for the church. Without Walls would begin expanding to new locations in 1999, starting first with an old Canada Dry warehouse in Tampa that was renovated to become Without Walls' main campus. Paula and Without Walls would continue to gain revenue, followers, and properties over the course of the next few years, which culminated in the 2001 founding of Paula White Ministries. This would serve as the media arm of Without Walls' operations. A lot of these early sermons of Paula's tragically went unpreserved, it seems, but we still have some. Let's go ahead and take a look at a clip. They told me I couldn't preach this gospel because I had an incurable lung disease and my lungs were operating at 28 to 38 percent. They told me at Mayo Clinic, told my husband, take her off the road or she'll die and you'll bury her six feet under. Well, that was fact, but that wasn't truth. That was fact, but it was not true. Nope, not gonna think about that one too much. I can already feel my brain trying to short circuit. Although I do think we just figured out where Kellyanne learned about all those alternative facts, eh? Now, 2002 would prove to be a momentous year in Paula's life. Particularly, she would meet two very influential people who would give her career a significant boost in their own very distinct ways. The first of these individuals is T.D. Jakes. Now, some of you all may know T.D. Jakes as one of the prominent voices of the prosperity gospel in the United States. Jen and I know him as number two. 274 on our list of episodes we haven't gotten around to yet. But for the sake of this video, the important thing is to know that he is a powerful preacher of the prosperity gospel and that he was a professional and spiritual mentor to Paula White. Tell us what's going on with you right now. Well, first I want to say what an honor it is to be with the two of you. In yes. life, I believe that um, Henry Drummond said that we are all mosaics of the men in our life, the people in our lives, mm -hmm. and that we become a part of those that we interact with. A large part of who I am, the development, the cultivation, 
musicians staying on a track, the, the maturing is, is due to the two people that I had the privilege to sit with that I had been able to call my spiritual father and mother for almost people. 23 years. Jakes calls her Dr. Paula White, but she does not have an advanced degree of any kind. This isn't the only example either. She's been using the title of doctor for years and people just seem to kind of let her get away with it. But seriously, Dr. Mantis Toboggan is more of a doctor than she is. That all being said, T.D. Jakes mentorship definitely had an influence. You can see it in her preaching style. I lost a lot of stuff. I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of strength. I lost a lot of courage. I lost a lot of time. I lost a lot of money, but I kept down on my knees. I was still believing. Broke, I was believing. Lonely, I was believing. Betrayed, I was have been dropped in life and we don't function fully we, we don't maneuver right things don't function the way they should because we've been dropped by somebody we trusted and loved and we don't understand why was i dropped jakes was also instrumental in helping legitimize paula to the black evangelical community who would come to form a large percentage of her follower base shoot one of the nine broadcast networks she expanded to with paula white ministries was black entertainment television and ebony magazine would proclaim you know you're onto something new and significant when the most popular woman preacher on the Black Entertainment Network is a white woman. Or if you don't trust that, you could just take Brad's word for it. She met a lot of black preachers, and according to her son Bradley Knight, she began to pick up their vocabulary and cadence. The black community told her, you're a white girl that preaches black. So who was this second influential person that Paula met during 2002? Well, it's none other than the most devout American president in history, Donald John the Baptist Trump. Fun fact, that picture on my computer, it's actually called Trump Pray Crop because it's a picture of Trump well, at least it looks like he's praying, and I had to crop it down to size. You may also recognize Trump Pray Crop as Jen's less popular attempt at an Eat, Pray, Love sequel. Let's hear Paula tell us a little bit more about this relationship with Donald. Is it accurate to describe you as Donald Trump's spiritual advisor? Other people put that label on. I would never say that about myself, but have I had a spiritual position and role in Donald Trump's life? For 15 years, I have. Did you bring Donald Trump to Jesus? Um, I've laid out the gospel very clearly, and I know that Donald is saved. And see, this wasn't a one-sided thing either. Donald was just as open in regards to his admiration for Paula. Here he is, as quoted by Larry King, endorsing her book, You're All That. And Donald Trump jumps in with, Paula White is not only a beautiful person, both inside and out. She has a significant message to offer anyone who'll tune in and pay attention. She has amazing insight. The ability to deliver that message clearly as well as powerfully. Read this and you'll be ready for great success. She's an amazing woman. Now, reports indicate that Trump noticed Paula the same way that he seems to notice anything that comes into his worldview, uh, by seeing her on television. He was apparently inspired enough by this exposure to fly her out for intermittent Bible studies and other engagements throughout the next decade and a half, and Paula and Randy even purchased a Trump Tower New York City condo in 2007. And according to Paula, and literally nobody else, he even had her on the set of The Apprentice. White success drew her to Trump as well. Are you ever up in New York? He asked her during one of their subsequent calls. Well, I am sometimes, she responded, thinking of a Bible study she was leading for the New York Yankees at the time. The Apprentice, a reality show produced and starring Trump, had started in early 2004, and she says he wanted her to be on the set, especially during the first season, for informal Bible studies or prayer for whoever wanted it. A quick survey of more than a dozen Apprentice alumni didn't unearth anyone who recalled her presence during the seasons they were with the show. But White says she remembers specific people who asked for her books and prayers. I went to different episodes, different tapings, and I was at the finales for one or two of the shows, she says. There were people I began to meet with, and there was a lot of prayer for a lot of people. Okay, point of order. I feel like Donald Trump has probably asked a lot of attractive, skinny blonde women throughout his life if they're ever in New York City, and I'm pretty confident when I say that Bible study was probably the absolute last thing on his mind. I'm much more creeped out now than I expected to be. Ugh. Let's take a step away from Trump, if you don't mind. If I start talking about him too much, I end up breaking out in a rash. And really, at this point in Paula's career, he was just one celebrity on an already impressive list of clientele. She was particularly a favorite of professional athletes, it seems. Bishop Randy White and his wife, Pastor Paula White, once headed up one of the fastest growing Christian congregations in the country. In its heyday, Without Walls International Church boasted more than 23,000 members, took in as much as $40 million a year in donations, 
fans and attracted dozens of professional athletes to its high-energy services. Major League Baseball players like Gary Sheffield, Daryl Strawberry, and Carl Everett, and NFL players like Michael Pittman, Hardy Nickerson, and Derek Brooks were among those who attended services at a converted Canada Dry plant in Tampa, Florida, a short drive from the Buccaneers' Raymond James Stadium, according to Randy White. She was also reportedly the spiritual life coach for supermodel Tyra Banks and even appeared on her show. No, not that one, the less important one that people don't care about anymore. Ah, there we go. You remember that one? Yeah, I probably just unlocked a repressed-ass memory for a bunch of you. But for real, Paula supposedly goes on the Tyra Banks show to counsel promiscuous young women or something. I have no idea because I couldn't find the clip. It seems to have gone completely AWOL. I looked everywhere and no luck. If you or someone you know has access to Season 2, Episode 17 of the Tyra Banks show, I would be forever in your debt if you could provide that to me. I do not want to die before these beautiful baby blues lay eyes on that scene. Without Walls would continue to grow throughout the aughts, gaining money and followers. The period from 2004 to 2006 alone saw the organization bring in $150 million in donations. As you might expect, it would seem that a great deal of this money would go to fund the Whites' lavish lifestyle, including their mansions and private planes. And we know all of this because of all people Chuck freaking Grassley opened a 2007 investigation into the Whites and other megachurch pastors to see what exactly they were doing with all of those donations they would collect. Senator Grassley is the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee. He's also the former chairperson of that committee. This week, he sent out letters to six megachurches across the nation. He wants to know about their expenditures, their finances, and their donations. It's an incredibly popular church in Tampa with a diverse congregation. According to the church's own website, the Without Walls Church brought in nearly $40 million in 2006. Now Republican Senator Charles Grassley wants to know how they're spending it. This fits in with what my crusade is as former chairman of the committee and now ranking member. The committee's responsibility to make sure that the tax laws are followed and when there's a tax exemption for charitable giving, that it's not abused. Grassley sent letters to six megachurches across the nation this week. He wants to know about their expenditures, their earnings, and their purchases. In the case of the Without Walls Church, founders Randy and Paula White have an incredible lifestyle by most standards. They own a mansion on Bayshore, an apartment in Trump Tower. The church has its own jet. Randy White drives a Bentley. When does government have the right to investigate churches like this to find out where and how they spend their money? Well, first of all, we have no right being in involved with doctrinal issues, and this doesn't involve that at all. This involves their nonprofit status as any nonprofit organization. It involves the tax laws being enforced and followed. The senator says church members should also be questioning their finances. Because if I'm contributing to a church, I ought to know that my money is being used with the intent uh, that it, in, in which it was given. Grassley also wants to know why lavish expenditures are needed by legitimate churches. Uh, I think for a person like me, it's this simple. Jesus came into the city on a simple donkey. To what extent do you need a Rolls Royce to uh, expand the ministry of Jesus? <sighs> I think we've hit the peak of this roller coaster now. Let's take a moment to ponder exactly how a mega pastor like Paula would be able to fund such a lavish lifestyle in the first place. What exactly does she proclaim to believe? What does she preach? And how is she just so damn appealing to so many people? Now, the Paula White Ministries website may be full of spiritual nonsense, but it is very well laid out spiritual nonsense. It's incredibly easy to navigate, and it even conveniently lists all of her main beliefs in one convenient summary page. But interestingly enough, it seems like for all of the criticism that Paula takes, this point about the Trinity is the one that seems to piss her off the most. From CNN, I have been called a heretic, an apostate, an adulterer, a charlatan, and an addict. It has been falsely reported that I once filed for bankruptcy and my personal favorite, that I deny the Trinity. Okay. Jesus is not the only begotten Son of God. He is not. I'm a son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first 
barn of many. But see, behind all the doctrinal squibbles and the boilerplate beliefs, Paula was chosen to be Christ's ambassador to the Trump White House for a reason. She's fully non-affirming of the LGBTQIA plus community, as you might expect, and is also vehemently pro-life. It, it, it's fine that we minister to everyone. It's not okay to have an abortion. It's not okay to marry the same sex. I knew that one was gonna be the one, all right? It's not okay. And just for fun, let's hear her thoughts on BLM and Antifa. I said this yesterday and I'll say it again. I don't, listen, there, there are a lot of demonic organizations and they are that. KKK is demonic. Black Lives Matter. Okay, Antifa. People go, oh, you can't believe you say that. Absolutely. Furthermore, Paula White is a prosperity preacher. For the unaffiliated, that means she endorses tithing and, and a planting of the seed, if you will, that one hopes will bloom into greater rewards from God on down the line. This could be things like financial windfalls or recovery from serious medical ailments. Now, most of us here are probably at least somewhat aware of how megachurch prosperity pastors can convince struggling, downtrodden, oppressed people that if they prioritize church donations, God will reward them with favor at some indistinct point in the future. There's so much I want to get to you. There, there's just so much to study. And you go, well, how do I do it? Well, for your first fruits offering, because I don't even want to say gift because this is so holy. It belongs to the Lord. For your first fruits offering, and first fruits is the full of, it's not the tithe. Tithe is one tenth of your gross income. It's the first tenth, not just any tenth. That's why it redeems the curse. But the first fruit is the whole of. Many of us bring one day. Some of us bring one week. Some of us bring an entire month's salary because we understand the principle of all first belong to God. These donations often end up, like we saw before, just supplementing the luxury lifestyles of church elites like Paula and her immediate family, while at the same time providing no benefits to the contributors, at least tangible ones, and even potentially exacerbating their lack of resources through all of this unnecessary sacrifice. Paula is more than happy to tell her followers, don't stop believing, while she takes their money and gives nothing nothing in return. If you want to know more about the prosperity gospel, I really recommend Jen's video on Kenneth Copeland. She does a bit more of a deep dive than we're going to do here today. Losing my mind. Ooh, I am really getting that Brian Pillman bang. Hell yeah. I sweated it down earlier, but like, I don't know. I, I like it. It's rocking. It's rocking. I got a mullet. Did y'all see it? We'll see her get physically wrapped in a copy of the Torah by Ralph Messer. Uh, just so you know, Ralph Messer is a practitioner of messianic Judaism who likes to pretend that he's a rabbi and haphazardly modify sacred Judaism. Jewish rituals into whatever these inane practices of his are. All right. And you'll face the, the camera, Paula, if you'll just stand up right now and turn and face the camera. We want to do something with you. To your listeners right now, we're going to wrap a scroll around you. Would you mind? No. This is whole, so sacred. If you'll ra raise it up high in the air, all right? We're going to wrap a scroll around you. And the scroll around you that we wrap around you is symbolic how God has right now protected your life. You are hidden in the Word of God. You are hidden in the Torah, God's teaching and instruction. There is nothing that can, absolutely nothing, Paula, in your life that will ever, ever, ever touch you. Now, as God opens up the Word of God to you, He opens up the Lamb book of life which you are written in the midst of and God said out of this out of what something that was thrown off the tracks like your life God says I'm gonna raise it up and people are gonna read from it and quote it for generations and here you are <laughs> in the midst of a Torah school people, the, the, you know the rarity in the synagogues Paul the, these are held and under eternal lights in arcs and, and you, you're taking a finger of God and we touch them because they're so sacred to us what does the Lord do today he says you're so sacred to the body of Christ I'm wrapping you in the Word of God it's a new beginning, a new Passover, your Passover from the past to the future, and you're blessed of God. Amen. Paula White is really into fasting, and by that I mean not eating for denoted particular periods of time. Paula believes fasting to be an inscrutable tenet of the Christian faith. Praise the Lord. I've got at least three people on board with me, but Jesus only needed 12, so I only need nine more. Amen. So Jesus goes on and he reveals, because Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12 says, a three-quart string cannot easily be broken. So it's really interesting because Matthew 6 is really talking about three things, giving of alms, praying, and fasting. 
And so he goes on and he reveals, when you pray, when you fast, when you give, he says, nothing shall be impossible. Now, if I was sitting here preaching, and I mean just doing hooping and homiletics and hermeneutics and breaking it down, and I was, hey, hey nothing will be impossible with God. And that impossibility in your life is about to be broken down in the name of Jesus. And right now, I decree and I declare that everything that is limiting you and holding you back, that God is going to pull you into a realm of the supernatural and he's about to elevate you into a place of impossible, into a place that all things are possible. You would be running around this church doing backflips. But you know what God says? He says, when you pray, when you fast, and when you give, nothing shall be impossible. But even beyond this religious factor, she approaches the subject of not eating with almost the zeal of an insufferable hobbyist. It's like that friend we all have who really got into Settlers of Catan one summer and always found a way to turn the conversation back back to the game. Her website here gives a thorough breakdown of the importance of fasting as part of Christian ritual practice, a listing of the biblical backing for that idea with verse citations, and gives a complete breakdown of the kinds of fast that one can partake in. Now look, I understand that fasting is a reasonable ritual or practice that many people take part in for perfectly healthy, spiritual, or personal reasons. I'm not disparaging the practice on its own, but I do feel a bit concerned when someone who has an already confessed history of eating disorders starts telling me that God is smiling upon my growling stomach. I seem to recall another skinny blonde mega pastor who had a similar message that gave me similar heaves. There is something extremely victorious about waiting, having the victory over denying yourself and waiting for that hunger is some of the most happy moments you're going to feel. I want you to learn to love the wait. You can take a walk, you can listen to the tapes, you can play with your children. You can make up your own puzzles. Oh, and there's also this little nugget, which I find horrifying. So it's a significant reason to fast, is to release people from bondages, from sins, and from strongholds. Now here's some good news. Not only will it loose you, but you can fast for other people. You, you, I, I fasted for my son. I fasted for my children. There was a time that Rachel and Rachel and Brad and myself all fasted for Hank. Now I think Hank is more spiritual than all of us. No. And so there was a time that we, we were all fasting for Hank. And so there are times that you can come together and fast for another person. Oh, no, it's fine, Johnny. If you want to leave the church and explore other religions, that's perfectly fine. Mommy will just stop eating until you make the right decision. Oh, Paula also speaks in tongues a lot. I know a lot of people do it. I find it unnerving, so I'm gonna mention it. Mahanda Agasata, Reke Yamanda Raboko Sokota, Ronda Yakande Eke Seke La Mama Manda Rabata Se, Meta Rabakande E La Babaka So, Yalamana Niana No, Sakayato Yakande, Yamakato Yabatania City, I can know Yakatara City. Power! So with all of this in mind, how is Paula able to get people to keep showing up and cutting the checks, even with all of this baggage? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. She is a phenomenal public speaker. The Bible says he went down to Lodabar. Lodabar means a place of wilderness, because when you've been dropped in your life, it causes something to go into hiding. It causes something to live in a wilderness. My God, you push everybody out that tries to love you because you're in a wilderness. Your money is in a wilderness. Your spirit's in a wilderness. I don't know what it is, but somebody's been dropped. And the Bible says that Mephibosheth, we don't know his name in full, but in part, his name means shame. And that's the perplexing point, is that a person that didn't do anything to cause themselves to be dropped now feels shame. Because when you've been dropped in life, you feel responsible for the crippling effect that it's had on you. And you don't understand, why wasn't I loved? Why am I not worthy? What is wrong with me? Nothing was wrong with you, baby. You were dropped like all of us were dropped. But you can't spend the rest of your life with self-hatred and low self-esteem looking at your crippled feet. You've got to figure out to the best of your ability how you can get one of those little legs in front of the other little leg 
in front of the other little leg and begin to get on the path that God has for you because God says I'm about to straighten out places that were crooked and messed up in your life and I'm going to heal every place that you're hurting Mephibosheth. I mean, listen to that. Yeah, okay, the tiny Tim bit in the middle was a little bit extra, but the content there is excellent. And honestly, I think she's making a universally inspiring point. I don't know about y'all, but I haven't been that moved since the first time I heard the Dusty Rhodes Hard Times promo. It's not even just the delivery either. I can't find anything wrong with the message. We all have been hurt by forces outside of our control, and it may not be our fault, but sometimes it's better for us to try and move forward as best we can. And when we do that, and push ourselves, oftentimes we do end up finding strength that we didn't even know we had. And shoot, a lot of people have probably been motivated by God or spirituality to make changes like that. For the struggling and disenfranchised, these can be such important things to hear. It's so validating, it's so uplifting, and words like these can bring hope when life has you down in the dark and pinned to the floor. In a vacuum, Paula is just making a wonderful, compassionate point about finding pride and progress and power through struggle. The problem is, the point's not made in a vacuum. Not even a minute later in the exact same sermon, she goes on to say this. I respect so much about David as he was a covenant man. He was a struggling man, but he was a covenant man. He had his issues, but he kept his covenant. And David made a covenant a long time ago where there were no lawyers and there was no ink and there was no blood. There was just a God that sits up high and looks down low. And he made a covenant with Jonathan, said, I've got your back and you've got mine and I'm gonna take care of you even after you're gone. And when he gets to his place, he doesn't forget the promise that he made. See, some of you have forgotten because you've been processed so much you forgot the promises you made when you were in the process but a covenant person says when I get there I remember that it was God that brought me through so that when I'm sitting in a position that I won't play games with this platform that God has given me but I remember the purpose I remember the goodness of God I remember that God reached his hand and brought me out and given what we already know about Paula the purpose here is clear you need to remember Remember to thank God for what he's given you and to praise him for all of your successes. And given what we know, that would probably mean sacrifice and donation to the church, ergo donation to Paula. So essentially, Paula is encouraging her flock to recognize sacrifice and struggle as holy sacraments of God and that by sacrificing their income to her, they can expect some unknown reward at some point on in the future. You get people to love the pain and the sacrifice, and then you gleefully scoop up all the things that they sacrifice. It's like telling the whole town that the wishing well will fix their problems, and then scooping the coins out when everybody goes to bed at night. Suffice it to say, you have to be charismatic to pull off something like that, and in broad daylight for years, no less. And Paula White is charismatic as fuck. Okay, so we've got an idea now of how the Paula White ministry machine works. So, since 2006, where is it gone? Sadly, 2007 would mark the end of Paula and Randy White's marriage. They do seem to remain on good terms and continue to collaborate professionally for many years afterwards in various media and ministry endeavors. Now, you may have seen in 2021, Randy would semi-viral for a Facebook post where he supposedly disparaged Paula regarding bits of sex, lies, and heresy. For 10 years, I have watched people listen to her lies. This was the night she begged me to tell the people we were getting a divorce. I said, no, nope. but her mind was made up. She sent 10 men to my house and told me how wrong I was for divorcing her. And I said, men, you were talking to the wrong person. I wanted to stay married, but when she had at least five multiple affairs to all married men, she needed another way out. I can tell you now that 80% person of what she has said, preached, and wrote about isn't even close to truth. I know the whole truth because I had to live it. You want more? Let me know. Hashtag betrayal. Hashtag Paula White lies. Okay, now the official statement from Randy and Without Walls is that this was the result of a hack. Now look, I understand that I got hacked is the liar's new favorite phrase, right? I don't really see any reason not to trust them on this, though. I know the drama's fun and I really want to believe it, but Randy has said only nice things about Paula up to and following this incident, so it would be a really odd change of character for him to do this all of a sudden. Plus, Randy is 64 years old. You know old people. His password was probably Jesus 
Jesus123 or something. I doubt it took the hacker man to get in there and cause a little chaos. By the way, that doesn't apply to any of our lovely senior Genonites. And on the flip side, Paula has approached Randy with the same vague positivity with which she seems to approach everything in her life. What did end the marriage? Oh, boy, that's, uh, that's a large question, but I think, you, you know... You didn't answer it in the, in the address, did you? Uh, no, but it, no one goes into a marriage. When I went into my marriage 18 years ago, I thought I'd end my life with Randy. And the divorce was not anything that I ever wanted to happen. And so when you say what made it, I don't know if you can say this was the one thing, because even... Uh, there are crucial things that cause fractures, breaks, whatever, in relationship. Oh, and just as an aside, this particular interview does give us just some wonderful insight into Paula's feelings about politics. Do you take a political stand? When you say get involved support, in politics. support any candidate? You know, I have my own personal opinions, but they're just that. I stay in my lane of assignment and do what I'm supposed to do in life. So that was a fucking lie. Now, throughout the period from 2008 to 2011, Without Walls would begin to struggle financially, and Paula would begin putting overtime hours seemingly to try and keep it afloat. Buildings were being sold, utility bills were going unpaid, and staff were being turned over and replaced on a consistent basis. Paula would end a tour of nationwide self-promotion, I mean speaking and preaching engagements, to return and take over the past duties of Without Walls Tampa campus in 2009, citing Randy's health concerns. She would also go on to take over their Lakeland, Florida sister campus in 2011. And in the midst of all of this, Paula would be hit with a salacious tabloid scandal. Photos were published in the National Enquirer of her and fellow megachurch pastor Benny Hinn, seen here holding hands outside of a hotel in Italy. Now, looking at these photos, it's pretty obvious why people might speculate some sort of romantic engagement. I mean, holding hands outside of a hotel in Italy, if that doesn't say love and touch and squeeze and I don't know what does. And considering Hinn divorced his wife the same year over quote-unquote irreconcilable differences, it's pretty hard to believe that he was acting faithfully. Although I do wonder if her opinions about the National Enquirer have changed given her most recent political affiliations. And while Paula was reported to take over the Lakeland site in 2011, other reports indicate that it was mostly abandoned by this time and had stopped giving sermons months prior. 2011 is also the year we would see the conclusion of the previously mentioned Chuck Grassley investigation, which would lead to precisely no consequences for anyone. Without Walls even refused to participate in the investigation entirely. Man, being rich, white, and godly really does mean that you can have it any way you want it, doesn't it? Just tell the investigators, I don't really feel like it, and you could just like straight up not testify. <laughs> but at least the report would demonstrate that Paula and Randy spent millions of dollars in church funds padding their own lifestyle. It provides us a paper trail of the swindlery. Paula would go ahead and fully jump ship from Without Walls in 2012, taking over senior pastoral duties at the New Destiny Christian Center in Apopka, Florida. This story in itself is a bit of a notable event. The lead pastor of New Destiny prior to Paula was Reverend Zachary Timms, who tragically passed away in a New York hotel room in August of 2010. While it wasn't known at the time, he did pass away in the midst of a relapse due to an overdose of both heroin and cocaine. Zachary's widow, Reva, would attempt to sue New Destiny Christian Center to block this transition of power, claiming that the church was robbing her children of their inheritance, namely operating control of the church itself. A prior contract with New Destiny, though, prevented Reva from moving forward with this lawsuit, and despite her best efforts, senior pastoral duties of the church would be transferred to Paula on January 1st of 2012. For her part, Paula maintained grace throughout the situation, even as many NDCC attendees these did not greet her with open arms. Meanwhile, according to the Orlando Sentinel, Paula White addressed the contested transition, telling congregants at the New Year's Eve service, I'm not asking you to like me. I'm not asking you to love or respect me because I'll do the work to earn that. I always ask people, give me one year of your life and I promise you will be changed. I don't know about anyone else here, but despite all the turmoil surrounding the situation, it just feels a little icky that a grieving black widow had her promised church yanked away from her by 
a shifty, lily white woman like Paula White. I don't know. I mean, especially when they'd go on to change the name to City of Destiny, and she'd end up handing it over to Brad. And Without Walls would finally go under in March of 2014, filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. I know it may seem like Paula White milked the organization for all it's worth before callously splitting when things got really bad, but Paula doesn't see it that way. And it's really important to her that you understand that she has not declared bankruptcy. They say she's filed bankruptcy. I've never filed bankruptcy. Um, I had resigned without walls. I'd had absolutely no part. No, no, no. See, in 2004, Paula was far too busy to worry about, you know, the complete financial collapse of her former congregation. Well, with what, you might ask? What? A budding romance. Now, hold on. I want you all to take a moment and think about this. Who do you think this new suitor might be? We know she likes religious boys, good Christian boys, but she's got a thing for the rock stars and the bad boys, too. So... Who, who do you think this might be? Hmm? Did you guess the keyboard player from Journey? Because it's the keyboard player from Journey. There is nothing I can think of more cosmically hilarious than that, is there? Oh yeah, get a load of these two. They are definitely looking for a unicorn on Craigslist as we speak. Paula met rocker Jonathan Kane around 2014 and began dating him shortly after his divorce finalized. She tells the story way better than I could ever hope to. On the Southwest flight, which made no sense for me to be on, and we'll tell more about that. Yeah. I should not have been on that fi flight. And um, in fact, I had tried to book it three weeks earlier and they're like, it's sold out. I'm like, come on, it's Southwest. Somebody's gonna drop <laughs> off, Susie. But I meet my husband. Husband John, who plays her journey, certain like some of the most iconic songs That's right. and incredible. Look at wow, how sexy how man! Beautiful. Like, oh my gosh, that's like one of the best days of my life. Besides get, having uh, getting saved and having my children and grandchildren, <laughs> and they're all there, but Jesus first. So wow, celebrities really are just like the rest of us out here on Southwest Airlines flight, choking on nearly pulverized Biscoff cookies and lukewarm Sprite with three millimeters of legroom. Shoot. She even managed to find love in a time where most of us are just looking for an emergency exit, so bravo to her. And this whirlwind romance would culminate in marriage in April of 2015. And for what it's worth, Paula does seem legitimately happy in these photos. You only make eyes like that when you love a woman. I mean, love a man. Jonathan himself is a devout Christian and has recently become a central part of Paula's stage act. Here we can see him participating in a sermon with Paula. Another part of it is, ladies, if you don't know what he likes, you know, figure it out. Get a book. What? Go get some porn, do something, whatever. <laughs> if he likes to watch porn, watch porn with him. You know what I mean? It, it's like, you gotta get where you gonna go. Figure it out. <laughs> okay, well that was disturbing. Uh, <laughs> the music part. Maybe he's good at that. I mean, come on, he has to be, right? He's a literal rock star, and Journey's arena rock, so you know he knows how to be charismatic in front of a crowd, right? Right? Jesus, we worship you tonight, tonight. Oh, that is unfortunate. Journey definitely made the right call to have him on the keyboard, though. Way in the back and with a mic that you can unplug pretty easily. Well, truth be told, I think Paula's just lovestruck and wants all of us to appreciate her hubby as much as she does. Oh, and for the record, she technically goes by Paula White Kane now. Although for advertising privileges, she still does maintain the rights to the name Paula White, so both are pretty appropriate. Also, didn't White Cane go on tour with uh, Journey? Oh no, that was White Snake. My bad, y'all. And before we move on, I also just need to mention that this picture exists. Now, I wanted to bring this picture up gracefully, but I couldn't figure out how, and it's just too important. I just need you to really soak it in. So now we move on to 2016, which would see the beginnings of the alliance between Paula and Donald Trump, not as a celebrity endorser, but as a powerful political figure. She would hold a prominent seat on his campaign's Evangelical Advisory Committee throughout 2016, and she even received credit from James Dobson himself for leading Trump personally to Jesus Christ. Christ, albeit in the most non-committal way possible. Only the Lord knows the condition of a person's heart. I can only tell you what I've heard. First, Trump appears to be tender to things of the Spirit. I also hear that Paula White has known Trump for years and that she personally led him to Christ. Do I know that for sure? No. Do I know the details of the alleged conversation? I can't say that I do. Am I aware of who either of these people are? No. Do I know my own name? 
it's questionable. Trump and Paula would go ahead and make their relationship official at the very beginning of 2017, immediately following his presidential election victory. Her coming out party would be none other than the inaugural prayer. We come to you, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, with grateful hearts, thanking you for this great country that you have decreed to your people. We acknowledge we are a blessed nation with a rich history of faith and fortitude, with a future that is filled with promise and purpose. We recognize that every good and every perfect gift comes from you, and the United States of America is your gift, for which we proclaim our gratitude. As a nation, we now pray for our president, Donald John Trump, Vice President Michael Richard Pence, and their families. Now, hey, getting to deliver the Almighty God's blessing at the formal transition of power for one of the world's remaining superpowers, that's truly remarkable all on its own. And that's not even to consider the fact that Paula is the first woman to ever deliver the inaugural prayer. But for real, we all know she was there to promote that podcast. You know, Jen and I were on a podcast recently. It's called Grazing Hell, and it's made by two very good friends of the channel, Tara Mooney and The Cow. You should go listen to that podcast, and you should never, ever listen to Paula White's podcast. Initially with Trump, Paula would only occupy the informal role of spiritual advisor. This wasn't really an official designation, but even so, it held a unique kind of power, and Paula was more than happy to go full Regina George on all of the lesser pastors beneath her. So here she was in the summer of 2017 at the head of a long table in the executive office building. A huge French empire structure just steps from the White House, addressing a group of religious leaders who had been invited to Washington by the president's evangelical advisory council. With her blonde hair, scarlet Oscar de la Renta sheath dress, and matching patent leather stilettos, she was a bright bird among the forest of dark-suited clergymen, and she made it clear the one with the access to Trump. The president says hello, she told them. I was with him first thing this morning. Because of white, evangelicals have an unprecedented opportunity to have our voices and say heard in the Oval Office. Tim Clinton, president of the American Association of Christian Counselors, informed the assembled pastors. God has placed Paula in a unique place for such a time as this. Oh, and rest assured, Paula brought all of her shitty opinions with her. She was particularly supportive of Trump's decision to formally recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel in late 2017 as opposed to the rest of the world, which recognizes Tel Aviv as the capital of Israel. American evangelicals were by and large one of the only groups supportive of this decision, and since they hold a unique amount of voting power in the Republican Party and have a particular distaste for some of Trump's most favoritist hobbies, something was needed to pad their support heading into the 2018 midterms. And I think we have every reason to believe that it might have been Paula who gave him this Jerusalem idea. But he that keepeth Israel will keep us. He will keep us as believers, as those in righteous, those who are in covenant according and on obedience to his word. Now see, where have I heard that before? And Paula carried that same zeal and influence into 2018 as well. Quoted from CBN, We'll be touching on everything from humanitarian, working a course on criminal justice reform, religious liberties, so many different aspects, mental health care, substance abuse, White said. White also responded to recent tweets from Trump in which the president boasted that he was really smart and a very stable genius. He He's great mentally, White said. Paula was particularly awful on the subject of immigration in 2018, making sure to earn her gold medal in mental gymnastics by going way out of her way to make sure that her beloved Jesus Christ wasn't in any way compared to immigrants at the American southern border. What biblical scriptures come to mind when you saw this? Well, you know, everyone, I think so many people have taken biblical scriptures out of context on this mm -hmm. to say stuff like, well, Jesus was a refugee, and yes, he did live in Egypt for three and a half years, but it was not illegal. If, it, if he had broke the law, then he would have been sinful, and he would not have been our Messiah. Oh yeah, I'm sure a man who preached all about taking in needy strangers from foreign lands would love to hear you positioning him way above needy strangers from foreign lands. October 2019 would finally see Trump put Paula on the 
formal White House payroll, specifically as the special advisor to his Faith and Opportunity Initiative. It was really just a rebranding of a rebranding of a George W. Bush political favor to his Christian voter base. The FOI and its prior iterations have all served as a kind of sanctioned government office for American religious interests, with a noted preference for those of the Christian evangelical variety. While the office itself doesn't hold a significant amount of formal decision-making power, they do have the president's ear on a wide variety of vital public policy matters. And likewise, Paula's official role in the Trump administration solidified that she was the representative of Christian values to that White House. Paula's values would be those that the U.S. president would hear when making vital decisions faith-based or otherwise. For my Christian viewers out there, do you think Paula White's views are the best way to represent Christianity to the most powerful man in the free world? And while Paula doesn't seem to have done much official business in this role, she was instrumental in helping Christian leaders develop a direct line of communication with Trump. And her actions since the end of 2019 would indicate that she is very interested in keeping this power, and that she was willing to lose her mind to do just that. Paula started out 2020 with a bang, gaining notoriety for this clip in January, and it never really slowed down from there. Any self-serving action, God, let pride fall, let pride fall, let pride fall, let pride fall. In the name of Jesus, we command all satanic pregnancies to miscarry right now. We declare that anything that's been conceived in satanic wombs, that it'll miscarry. See, now I'm confused. Are we supposed to abort the satanic pregnancies or not? Rosemary's baby needs to know. Oh, Paula was also really expeditious in finding ways to profit off of the COVID pandemic. Here she is soliciting donations from her congregation in March of 2020, right as businesses were just about to start shutting down and people were beginning to lose their jobs. The greatest thing we do is bring spiritual truths that transform. What we do as ministers of the gospel is so vitally important because every single day we are a hospital to the sick, not necessarily the physically sick, though we also help take care of that. Many churches have health centers, etc. But we are a hospital for those who are soul sick, those who are spiritually sick, because we bring forth the Word of God and we bring forth truth that gets deep down in your soul and the way you think and you feel about things. Maybe you'd like to sow a $91 seed, and that's just putting your faith with Psalm 91 or maybe $9 or whatever God tells you to do. If you want to be a blessing to Paula White Ministry or City of Destiny, you can go to the website at paulawhite.org. We would love for you to help us and stand with us. We'd love for you to stand with your church. Don't forget, now is not the time to abandon your covenant with God. It's the time that you go deeper. Stand with your pastor. Oh, and that's not even to account for the federal assistance she received directly as well. Among those approved for loans through the massive government relief program were a Dallas megachurch whose pastor has been an outspoken ally of the president, a Florida church tied to Trump's spiritual advisor and quote-unquote prosperity gospel leader Paula White, and a Christian-focused nonprofit where Jay Seculo, the lawyer who defended the president during his impeachment, is chief counsel. So Paula was able to secure federal emergency payroll protection funds for a tax-exempt organization organization while she herself was collecting a government salary. It's just impressive how awful that is. Oh, but Paula definitely looked to finish 2020 in style, too. Following the conclusion of the 2020 presidential election, Paula gave a series of notable sermons where she appeared to, for lack of better phrasing, go off the goddamn deep end. Oh, you don't believe me? Uh, all right, well, you watch this and tell me if this is a sermon run by someone who has all their marbles. In the name of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, we put a hedge of protection right now around the righteous. We put a hedge of protection right now around those that stand in the gap and make up the hedge. We put a hedge of protection. We put a wall of fire around President Trump right now. I do because I'm his pastor. I put a hedge of protection around him right now in the name of Jesus. I put a wall of fire right now around the first family. Oh, reminder there, Paula. According to 5e rules, you have to maintain a fourth level spell slot and prep your phosphorus ahead of time if you're going to cast Wall of Fire. Otherwise, the spell's just going to fizzle. And see, this type of unhinged tomfoolery doesn't go unnoticed for very long. And soon enough, City of Destiny gained even more notoriety over Paula's desperate cries to God asking that he personally recount the Arizona votes. She went ahead and toned things back down, and within a week or two, her sermons were back to 
well, as normal as they ever were. That's to say she's still a weird simp for Trump, but now she's not bringing the full orchestra or trying to invoke ancient arcane magics. Our nation right now, people think, you know, they'll say, President Trump divided our nation. And I always say people, I've had a 20 year relationship with him. I know him very, very well. I know his family very well. They'll say, I go, y'all sure do give one man a lot of power. He did not, but our nation is very divided. In the end, though, Trump's loss was verified and Joe Biden was sworn into office in January of 2021. Shortly after settling into his big, fancy new chair at his big, fancy new desk, Biden would utilize an executive order to change the name of Trump's Faith and Opportunity Initiative, replacing it instead with the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, and replacing Paula with an extremely non-controversial, lifelong government employee named Melissa Rogers. Oh, so you do know how to use the executive orders, huh? Do you, Joe? That's great. Do the student loans now. And really, that's been about it since the end of the Trump presidency. Paula returned to Apopka and her duties at uh, City of Destiny, and you would almost swear that her time in the Trump administration was some weird false memory. But don't be fooled. As recently as September of 2021, Paula announced the new Trump Christian Advisory Council. A move like this really only indicates that he's considering a run in 2024. And I think with everything we've seen today, we can assume that Paula's already packed her wagon and hitched it to the Trump train again. Paula White and Donald Trump 2.0. Only one way I can think of to describe that. It's like puking on a pile of shit. Well, that concludes our exhaustive review of the life and times of Paula White. Well, at least I'm exhausted, and I bet you all are too. Thanks for going on the ride, though. It's always nice to have a buddy when you go on the roller coasters. Now, when I began working on this episode of Fundy Fridays, truth be told, I thought it was going to be glossing up to 2016 and that things were really going to get interesting from there. I did not realize how wrong I would be or how conflicted I would feel about Paula at the end of all this. There are some positive things about her that I just can't deny. Paula emanates a kind of unflappable grace that I've seen from few people. I've watched a lot of Paula's taped sermons up to this point, and I can comfortably say that when she's not making it weird or pathetically grifting for donations, she is usually saying something pretty inspiring. I may not have always connected with the spiritual element of what Paula was saying, but I connected with the hope, the intensity, and the positivity of her words. I recall a lot of those same feelings when I listened to Bethel worship music, or when I listened Listen to Tammy Faye talk about getting the albatross of Jerry Falwell off of her neck. Regardless of whatever Paula White's about to say, you can rest assured she knows exactly how to say it. And furthermore, Paula truly has come from a life of struggle and difficulty all of her own. She is not the same kind of silver spoon baby that she associated with at the White House. I won't deny that in many regards she did build an empire at least somewhat composed of her own blood and sweat. And she really did seem to put in the work to connect her ministry to a wide variety of disenfranchised individuals. And it's for these reasons that it was just so disappointing to watch her sell out so gleefully time and time again. In some alternate timeline, I like to believe that Paula White's struggles led her to create a ministry that truly did look out for its congregants to use the things that she went through to protect others and to carve out a legacy as a positive progressive force in the world. I like to believe that exists somewhere out there. But instead, here, Paula only lived life to make herself untouchable, and she has stepped over many vulnerable people to reach that point. Paula built a record of callously exploiting her vulnerable flock, and she did it long before she ever reached the White House. She lived a life of luxury and excess on the back of money given to her from people who were just desperately looking for hope in a world that increasingly does not care about them. So when fellow scam artist Donald Trump recognized her as a valuable tool that could be exploited for his personal gain, it's upsetting but also unsurprising to see her jump so eagerly into that swamp. And Paula was such a good speaker that she was able to, with no real credentials of any kind, establish herself a voice in the White House and get consistent access to the ear of our country's lead executive. And her time in that position was only used to further harm the oppressed. Except this time, she had an even more expansive reach. See, instead of conning sick old ladies and out-of-work parents into making useless donations to her church, now instead she was able to help advance crackpot Christian policy ideas, demonize refugees, make additional strife for Palestinians, 
and siphon vital COVID protection funds into her own pocket. And when that power was threatened, Paula threw all of her faith behind a vitriolic temper tantrum as a flailing final attempt to keep herself in power. And see, she may pretend that things have gone back to normal now, but given what we've seen today, it's fair to assume that a lot of people will let her do that. But we don't have to, and I don't think that we should. See, there is a very good chance that this grifter will find her way back into the American government once again. Even if it's not Trump, Paula's just such a good speaker that I expect she'll be able to wriggle into the good graces of whoever the GOP runs next time. See, American conservative politics and evangelical Christianity are still inseparably intertwined in our country right now, and Paula White speaks those two languages as well as anyone on the planet. I just don't think this is the last we've seen of her no matter what we do, quite frankly. But it's just like I said when I was talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Deconstruction is about learning what the church did to you so that you can prevent it from doing that to you and others in the future. Now we know how Paula came into this world, how she wormed her way into American politics, how she was able to get all the way to the very top of the White House and all of the structures in place that allowed her to do so. Preachers will truthfully probably be talking themselves into the White House for the next 50 years. It started with Billy Graham, and it's never stopped since. Sadly, there will be other Paula Whites. But maybe we can stop this Paula White from doing any more damage. The wheel in the sky of American politics will never stop turning. But you can use your deconstruction as a wrench in the gears, if you will, to at least stop it from crushing the disenfranchised sometimes. And maybe all of us can prevent Paula White from ever riding that wheel to the top of the American political world ever again. Also, I've hidden nine Journey song titles throughout this episode. If you can find them all, put it in the comments. But seriously, I love you all. Give me a hell yeah and do something kick-ass this weekend, even if it means just getting out of bed or doing your laundry. All right, y'all. Well, I'm finished up today talking about Paula White. Um, I will be back in March with a new episode for you covering another Christian political individual of some kind. I don't know exactly who yet. We're still figuring that out. In the meantime, thank you all so much for continuing to be kind and for continuing to watch our content and uh, be a part of the community. We love you all so much. You take care. Strike and 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 strike until you have victory.